Good day, everyone. In this time of pandemic, there are many things that are feeling uncertain. Uh, and certainly among them, for those of us who are engaged as ministry professionals, the ways in which we practice self-care uh, seem at best different and at times uncertain. I know uh, in my life, there are many of my self-care practices that aren't available to me, whether it's going out to the movies or out to a dinner or watching uh, early season baseball at this time of year. I also know that there are some of my self-care practices which with a changed schedule are harder to fit into my daily routine. And so we thought it would be good to take a few moments and stop and talk about how does how do we as ministry professionals engage in self-care during this time? For those who do not know, I am the Reverend Gordon Rankin. I serve as the conference minister serving the churches of the New Hampshire Conference of the United Church of Christ. I am also someone who has been engaged as a boundary trainer for ministry for ministerial ethics uh, for the past 26 years. And with me today is the Reverend Dr. David Reynolds. And David, would you like to say a few words of introduction? Oh, sure. Thanks, uh, Gordon. It's a joy to be with you this morning. Um, I'm Dr. Reverend Dr. David Reynolds. I am an ordained minister in the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, your ecumenical partner with the UCC. I'm also a licensed pastoral psychotherapist. So I for 32 years, I've been providing psychotherapy for individuals, couples, and families, as well as spiritual direction and consultation services to clergy and to uh, churches. So it's a joy to be with you on this very important topic today. So as we prepare to engage in some conversation around self-care, it just seemed that the only appropriate way to begin that was with a little bit of grounding. And so I think you're going to provide that for us, David. Uh, yes. Uh, one of the scriptures that has been with me for this past month and that I uh, go to regularly uh, comes from uh, the Hebrew scriptures from Psalm 46. And it's the phrase that many of us know, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. And I think there's something about the stillness that allows us to be able to encounter uh, the holy, even at times, especially at times of a pandemic. So two ways that I've been using this scripture in my own practice. Uh, one is that um, by saying it and then lopping off one word, it's a very helpful practice to become grounded. So it goes something like this, be still and know that I am God, be still and know, be still, be. So it gives a little different emphasis each time that you sit with that phrase, and it's good to take uh, a few breaths and a few moments with that. Uh, the second way I've been using this scripture is um, in a mindfulness kind of practice. And um, with each word, I will uh, mentally say, uh, I will say the word it mentally, and uh, on the inhale, I will say a word, and on the exhale. Uh, it's not easy to do that uh, verbally, but it's on the inhale, I will say uh, B, and then exhale, stale, is still, inhale, and no, and no, exhale, that I am, on the inhale, God. So there's a four-part uh, rhythmic uh, use of mindfulness of both breathing and and reciting the scripture and I, I found that extremely helpful for me because uh, stillness is not always available to me internally and uh, this just reminds me of a way to do that so those are two ways to use that scripture uh, grounding because um, the holy is our refuge as well as uh, many other things, family and friends and community and the new ways we're doing it. 
But I think it, this scripture really focuses the uh, spiritual grounding of that. Wonderful. Um, I think we uh, had also hoped at this time to just engage everybody in a moment of prayer. Is it okay if I lead that? Absolutely. So friends, please join us in a moment of centering prayer uh, and start with a few deep of those uh, inhales and exhales. Oh, Holy One, please do center us in this time, for it can often feel like things in the world around us are happening at a faster pace than we can keep up with, that today's truths are tomorrow's uncertainties, that as soon as we uh, believe we know what's happening, the earth shifts under our feet. And so it is hard to feel like we are walking on a stable path when we look to the world to provide that stability. Help us to sink the roots of our faith deep into the fertile soil of your spirit, that we may be grounded and nurtured and fed by all that your spirit brings to us. Center us, calm us, still us for this moment. For indeed the world in this time of uncertainty needs those who are stilled into the presence of the divine. Help us as best we are able to be such people, serving as ambassadors of your spirit, witnesses to divine love, so that your world might know moments of healing, even in the midst of this time of pandemic. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, David, let's start with the broad picture. What does it mean, particularly from your, your mental health perspective, to be practicing self-care during this time of pandemic when so many things seem different? I think that uh, many times, for most of us, uh, so many uh, things have changed in our schedule and the structure and the way we normally do things. And uh, it's caused quite an upheaval uh, in that regard. So I, I think it's really important that uh, clergy in particular, but all people uh, work diligently at finding uh, their rhythm in this new way find their structures that uh, nurtures their soul. Um, I think that uh, I, I recommend that there at least be uh, some type of daily practice as well as some kind of weekly um, uh, respite. Uh, I think it's very crucial. And I know, uh, I, I know many clergy who are working uh, a lot uh, they've had to learn the new styles, uh, the technologies, uh, how that works, and it's it caused a lot more uh, time, hours, and energy uh, to do so. But even, especially at these times, I do recommend that uh, finding still that time of uh, rest, of Sabbath, is uh, very crucial. So I think the essence of it is people have, you, it's important to structure your own rhythm on doing this in the new way. And, and I'm guessing it's important to recognize that it's probably going to be a new and different rhythm. Right. I know I have um, made the comment um, regarding how churches function, that it's important to remember that 
extraordinary situations call for extraordinary responses. And if we keep using our ordinary responses, they're not going to meet the need of the extraordinary situation. I'm guessing there's probably some truth to that in self-care that our normal routines may not be the right self-care routines for this moment. Correct. I think uh, the pandemic has uh, given an invitation to really look at uh, our, our way of doing things and our rhythms. And what I'm finding personally and what I'm hearing from other people is that sometimes, indeed, as you said, uh, it, it will require uh, doing some new things in some new ways. It, it may require uh, trying a, another type of spiritual practice that uh, hasn't been uh, either easy to do or too familiar before. Uh, that's one side of it, is to be open to new ways of, of uh, practice, spiritual practice. Uh, the other thing that I'm hearing uh, is that sometimes people are being, are utilizing what they've normally used, but they've gone deeper into those practices. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, sort of a radical change, which some of us are being invited to, it's been going deeper into what, what they have been doing. And they found that uh, to be very nourishing. Wonderful. I know answering this question of how things have changed during this prime time of pandemic from a, a boundaries standpoint, uh, one of the things that I say in almost every, probably actually every boundary training I do is a reminder that boundaries are cultural and boundaries are contextual. Uh, and that's not to say as ministry uh, professionals that there are not some boundaries that are pretty much universal because the power and difference between the ministry professional and the person being served is so different that that boundary exists in almost every context. Um, but a lot of the everyday boundaries we deal with are quite contextual. And what I see happening during this time of pandemic is, you know, we have this setting in which we're used to ministering in, and the context of the world underneath us has just totally shifted. And there will be some new boundaries that are necessary. I mean, all the same old boundaries are not going to function as needed to have um, engaged ministry. But I think it's important to remember that there still needs to be boundaries. Uh, I, I think as helping professionals, it's easy in time of crisis to just say, oh, yep, this is a, a moment when we just throw caution to the wind and, and do it all. And uh, I am perceiving in this time of uh, such uncertainty that having some boundaries that provide some consistency is actually a gift to folks um, and not a limit that you know anything where people are offering that you know okay I'll be here for all of this but here's the boundary I need you to keep provides a little bit of, of consistency normalcy that people need that kind of being your experience um, yes it has and um, when uh, you mentioned about uh, the possibility of talking about boundaries, I remembered early in my training as a psychotherapist, um, I was privileged to hear uh, Dr. Cecil Rice, who was practicing in Boston at the time. And in his workshop on boundaries, he talked about boundaries uh, are indeed uh, what is not okay, what to not do, uh, and he, he broadened it. He was one of the earlier ones to do this, I believe, that boundaries are also stating what is okay, what is acceptable, what are appropriate ways for a professional to connect with uh, people. So um, I, I think both sides of that probably are being uh, explored. For example, uh, the normal uh, boundaries that we uh, know as professionals. Um, uh, that, uh, that they are still in place, but uh, we're connecting in very different ways. You know, in my work as a psychotherapist, uh, I'm now doing most of that at home, in my home office, uh, and I'm doing that uh, via video, just like we are doing today. Uh, I've never done that before. 
Uh, I've had rare phone con phone sessions when needed oh, throughout my years of practice, but uh, this is new. So the boundaries are still the same. It's not a friendship. It's not a, a relationship uh, in terms of friendship or other kinds of uh, relationships. But it's a it's a it is a relationship. It's professional, and all of those boundaries are still happening. We're working on the clinical goals. Uh, we're design, divine as, deci as decided between myself and the client. So we are connecting. I could, one can be warm and human um, and, and connecting, and there is the professional connection. So uh, I, I would highlight both sides of how we connect are different as well as, you know, there are some, the, the, the former, the boundaries that we know, uh, many of those are still in place, but they're, they're shifting a little bit. So I know in my almost 30 years of ministry, there have been a couple other times of um, where I felt like I've, the intensity of ministering in a crisis like I do this time. 9-11 um, was clearly one, um, the Sandy Hook shooting because I was in a church about 20 miles away and had family from that school that were connected with my church. There are parts of this that feel the same, and there's a big piece that feels very different to me. Uh, and the big piece that feels very different is those were events that happened, and you knew you were ministering to the trauma in the aftermath. What makes this feel so different to me is uh, we don't know when and how this ends. And I don't even know that we have confidence that we won't return to um, some level of um, normalcy. Um, I, I'm not sure I totally like that word, but some things that feel a little more like life did, you know, two months ago, and then might go back into some of this again. And that just, um, I think there's got to be so something that changes how you uh, both minister and how you take care of yourself in the midst of this when you don't know oh, this is just, you know, if I put this time in now, then a month from now, I know I can get some break time. I don't know that we know when the break time comes in this. I think that's a very good point. I think that is a different uh, uh, part to this uh, compared to other uh, crises and tragedies that we've dealt with. And this is where I would harken back to what I was saying earlier, that because we don't know, uh, it's very, very important that each each person, each clergy person, uh, develop your structure of how you're going to uh, take care of yourself and find the rhythms. I, I was recommending earlier there there needs to be daily ry rhythms, I believe, and also weekly rhythms because you know this could go on for months or two months. We don't know exactly, and that kind of unknownness also adds to the stress. It adds to the fatigue uh, and uh, compassion fatigue that, that many are feeling. So that's, that's where creating one's own structure is so crucial in dealing with this. I, I suspect it's also a really important thing to um, use our resources outside of ourselves in this time that um, in this elongated period when we're having to do new ways of ministry and new ways of self-care, um, we may not always be the best one to see how we're doing in the midst of that. And to use our resources like prayer groups and collegial gatherings, even if they're virtual, and communities of practice, or as we call them in New Hampshire UCC, pastoral leadership development groups, to use um, connections with friends, to use connections with uh, our partners and spouses, and, and to just say, you know, if you really see me not taking care of myself, I need you to call me on that. Um, because I may not be aware of it because I'm so investing in helping these others. Um, sometimes that little bit of perspective, I think, probably helps us know better how we're doing it caring for ourselves. Yes. Um, if I may use a personal illustration, 
uh, in March, my father passed away. And um, that was a, a significant event in my life and my family's life. Uh, it was just before all of the restrictions were given, so I was able to go. I know funerals are not being held now, but it was among the last that were held. Uh, this was in Kentucky. And um, one of the things that I have been doing is uh, with the pandemic, of course, uh, having to scramble, how, uh, can I see clients? How will I see clients? What platforms would be used? How will I contact them? It requires a new consent form uh, and on and on and on. And my colleagues at PCS and I and other agencies have had to scramble to do that. So that's immediately after uh, my father's passing, the funeral and coming back to New Hampshire. Um, one of the things that I've been working on is to hold space for my grief. In other words, I could, I could do 12, 14, 16 hours on all of that, this at first because it was just overwhelming to be figuring it out with my colleagues and I. So uh, what I've done is I've chosen to create space for my grief so that it doesn't get totally lost. Uh, and one of the ways I've done that is I have uh, in my circle of friends, I'm regularly talking to them. Uh, FaceTime, Skype, uh, is sometimes the phone and just talking about how that's going. And uh, with one of my friends, uh, yes, uh, this week, uh, I said, uh, you know, I've I'm, I'm decided to do this project. I said, you may want to take me on about that. So I even invite people to, uh, you know, that accountability, my, their, my accountability to them. So that, that's gone uh, pretty well. I've done uh, it's pretty well at that, I believe, to, hold space uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Certainly when I talk to friends, here's kind of the shape my grief is taking. So th that's one of the ways I created, I, I didn't think of it as accountability, but I think it's related to what you're saying, that, that I knew I needed to take care of myself and my grief during this time. I think it's a, a wonderful illustration and the reality is we're all dealing with griefs at this time. Um, there are plenty of losses and, and that is um, obviously the loss of lives that we grieve so much at this time, but there's all kinds of other losses that, that are happening for folks at this time that um, we're all grieving and uh, need to be attentive to that, need to, as you said, carve our own space for that. Yes. You know, my awareness is that uh, uh, culturally, we don't do very well at grief. I'm talking kind of nationally. Well, we don't do very well at grief. And, and you're right, there's so many losses. Uh, my heart goes out to uh, so many people are dying. Uh, there's a uh, loss of jobs. Uh, loss of income and benefits in some cases, uh, worry about how are we going to manage, how will our families manage, and uh, there, there's a lot of grief around that. So I, I do believe at the initial stages of, of the grief, it's very normal, it's, it's healthy even. Uh, usually it's named shock and denial. Uh, those aren't pejorative words, but it's just like, oh my goodness, this is so overwhelming. I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe I lost this loved one. I can't, and, and on and on. So I, I think uh, that the, that necessary first stage is gonna be there. And when we are scrambling, you know, we can't attend to the other aspects of grief. They will come along as they do. And I think it's important to make space for them. Uh, so individually, it's, it can be complex enough but wow, culturally, uh, I have heard of a few nations having uh, a day of mourning. I, uh, I think that's really healthy. I think that steps toward kind of culturally naming the losses and giving people space to, to mourn, to grieve, to, to be in sorrow. Uh, that's certainly been a feature of many ancient cultures. It's a very healthy part. I think, I'm hoping we will find ways to do that in our own culture, our own nation. That would be wonderful. You had 
talked a, a few moments ago when you were talking about uh, your time of grief about um, both transitioning the work you do to being on a video conferencing platform and using video conferencing um, connections with your friends to, to kind of keep track of, of your own care and to continue to process your own care. I, I know that one of the reality issues in our own care right now is uh, we're all spending so much time on these uh, video conferencing type platforms. Uh, I have uh, joked at a few times that uh, I wonder when I'm going to start dreaming in Zoom um, <laughs> because so much of my day is spent on Zoom. Do you have any advice for um, how to um, keep some balance and care about keeping those social connections while also recognizing that we're gonna need some time away from technology? Sure, sure. I mean, the realities are we're doing, most of us are doing a lot more of Zoom, et cetera, uh, types of uh, gatherings and connections. And uh, that's really good that we have that technology. I was thinking uh, earlier in the week about, wow, just think before all of this was available, you know, what, what would it look like when there needs to be uh, self-distancing and self-quarantining. So we're, there's no question we're doing more of it, and a lot of that is necessary for most of us in our uh, personal life and professional life. But I think it's important to also have time apart from this. And uh, the, the types of things that I'm hearing and doing in some cases, um, it's important to connect uh, with nature. Um, most of us uh, in New Hampshire are able to, to go out and safely social distance and uh, take all of the necessary precautions and to be out in nature, whether that's a walk in the neighborhood or in my case, it's uh, we get to, we're in the woods, you know, so we can walk in the woods. I, I think that's a, a good break from grounding. Um, I know that some people are by themselves at this time and other people are with families or other loved ones. And um, it's, it's important to connect with uh, those folks that are in your own setting. Um, I, I know that uh, often between sessions, um, I'll just need to say hi to my wife, Carol, or pet our Yorkshire Terrier, um, Gracie. So those give me some tangible grounding kinds of things. But I do believe even if you are uh, living by yourself at this time, and that can be very lonely, so I hope you're taking advantage of, of these opportunities through the technologies we have. But you know, in your own home, kind of ground yourself in, in your own home. The pictures, the, uh, the items that you have on shelves, um, just become more connected to your, your own home setting. Um, and then, you know, I know that some clergy uh, have young families and that, that creates its uh, unique challenges. Uh, there's uh, some people are calling it homeschooling, but it's really crisis schooling uh, where all of that is being done via the internet too. So I think it's important to connect with your, uh, your young ones or your teen, teenagers in other ways too. So again, it's that human contact to allow yourself to just have a break from uh, the, the video. And then the other part that has been emphasized a lot today is uh, in your own practice. Um, often I'll listen to podcasts or uh, my favorite uh, speakers as part of my practice in the mornings, but I've been doing that a lot less. I really need a break from the technology. So opening the scriptures or a spiritual read or watching the candle that burns uh, on the table. So uh, I think it's important to find other ways of connecting uh, and grounding oneself. Those, those are the re recommendations that come to my mind. Thank you. Well, it's probably closing it on time for us to, to summarize some of our thoughts before having a, a closing centering practice. I think for me, a, a couple of the things that really stand out um, in our conversation. Uh, first is just making sure that you're um, 
attentive to caring to all parts of yourself, um, that you need to look after your social stat self in this time, but you also need to be looking after your physical self. You need to be looking after your spiritual self. Um, you need to be a, a healthy whole person and um, that would be important. And then the reminder to utilize your accountability partners, um, whether those be the ones that are in the house with you or ones you connect with on a um, friendship basis or ones you connect with on a, a professional basis to, um, to allow them to reflect to you how you're doing and probably in many cases doing the opposite for them. Mm -hmm. Thoughts that you would offer in summary? Uh, I think in summarizing uh, the, the words or phrases that came to my mind are, uh, I think it's a combination of uh, spiritual practices um, and, and that whether that means new ones or going deeper or doing something that you don't think is a spiritual practice, but it really is, maybe knitting or crocheting but you never, you, maybe you haven't thought of it as a spiritual practice. Um, that's, that's one part of my summary. And then the other part of the summary is Sabbath, the whole concept of Sabbath, rest, that uh, even while there are more demands on us uh, who are serving people in cl as clergy or psychotherapists or in any uh, caregiving profession, of course, the medical people, um, is Sabbath. There, we need rest. There's, there's no way around that. When the heart beats, you know, there, there's a beat and then there's a rest. Um, and that comes from all, many religious traditions to have a, a, a time of rest. So I, I would encourage that um, spiritual practice and Sabbath. Wonderful. Well, and for spiritual practice, I think you're going to help uh, wind down our time together by um, engaging us in another practice. Yes, I, I would like to uh, remind or introduce a, a, a mindfulness meditation practice. Um, I'd say for two or three years, uh, mindfulness meditation has been my primary way, way of practicing. And, and I found it wonderful and, and, and deepening and uh, certainly uh, I've struggled with it because the dealing with the thoughts and the monkey mind and all of that. So I wanna offer this uh, mindfulness meditation uh, to listeners as a way of both resting and, and doing a spiritual practice. So um, I will uh, summarize it and I, I would invite whoever is listening to simply um, uh, be, be aware of yourself in your chair, on your couch, in your bed, however you're listening. And take a moment and become aware of your body. Um, it's easy to neglect that during crises like uh, we are in. But be aware of your body. And just, just uh, you may want to do a scan or you may want to just be aware. Are there uh, tight, tight places, aches and pains? And as you are being aware of your body, I invite you to begin to pay attention to your breathing. Um, there's not a right way to do this. There's not, uh, you have to do it a certain way, but pay attention to your breathing. And what do you notice about it? Mine's a little shallow because I'm in the process of presenting to you but I'm aware that I can now lengthen the breath and deepen it. But just find a rhythm that works for you, a depth and a rhythm. And as you breathe, I invite you to become aware of what is your primary reaction to this time that we're in. It could be a thought, it could be a feeling, it could be an awareness, and there may be many, so I ask you to choose one. And just be aware of, of what comes up. It may not happen in the time that we're doing this practice together. It may come later, that's okay. But just uh, stay with the question, what is your primary reaction? and be mindful of your breathing, find your rhythm. 
And when you've named that, I invite you to sit with that for just a moment. You've recognized um, the reaction, if it has come to you. And for just a moment, just sit with it. Don't analyze it. Don't uh, uh, try to make it go away. Don't wallow in it. Just sit with it. Just allow it to be there. Sometimes it helps me to see it in the chair across the room. And it's, it's almost like I just sit with it. Sometimes it becomes a dialogue partner, but mostly just allow. So when you've recognized your primary reaction and you allow it to be there with your breathing, uh, the next one is to investigate. And that is, by that I mean, where do you feel that reaction in your body? Sometimes you know immediately, sometimes it takes a little bit. Is it a tightness in the throat, in the chest? Is it a feeling in the gut? Is it a tension in the he a headache, a tightness in the shoulders? Just be aware and investigate, meaning where do I feel this in my body? And when you've named that, just be present to it. Again, like with the allow this, just allow it to be there, breathe into it. Notice what happens when you pay attention to your breath and breathe into that place in your body that you feel this. And the final part of our meditation is when you've done each of the three before, recognize, allow, investigate, uh, ask yourself, what do I need to do to nurture myself in light of what I've discovered? And again, sitting with that question, don't rush to an answer, let it emerge within you. It may be something you normally do, it may be something brand new. But what do you need to do to nurture yourself and stay with that? Breathing in, breathing out. Some of you will be aware that uh, the practice that I'm suggesting comes from Tara Brock, uh, who's uh, a Buddhist teacher in the Washington DC area. And she calls it RAIN, R-A-I-N, recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. And this is a really powerful practice. I've done it a lot over the past several years and I find it, uh, clients find it helpful and, and I hope you will. So as we bring this practice to an end, take a final breath or two. And know that we offer up this practice so that all beings may be free from suffering that all beings may know healing, and that all beings may know peace. Amen. Amen. David, I am so profoundly grateful for you uh, taking your time and uh, taking uh, all the things that uh, you practice and know how to do so well, as well as your vulnerability and sharing them with us today. Uh, so that we can all know a little better on how to care for ourselves during this time. Uh, it has occurred to me that um, this is probably a good reminder for some, and there may be others for whom this is um, a starter conversation who would like more conversation about such things. And it's probably good to mention as we close that that's a good time to uh, contact someone like me in a judicatory type office uh, or to use your accountability partners to make connections um, so that connections can be made with somebody like you who can engage in uh, these conversations on a longer basis. Uh, yes, so, very true. So thank you so much, David. Thank you everybody who is um, being a part of this. We hope you find um, uh, some really vital ways to care for yourself even during these challenging days. Have a good day.
Thank you, Gordon, for planning this. Thanks be to God.